Be honest, even if it hurts. Welcome to Fending America. I'm on a 13,000 mile road trip to meet Finnish Americans and figure out why they want to be here and learn about cultural differences. You'll meet exciting Finns and hear about their journeys in America. Our second episode in Washington DC comes with a career diplomat and we had the honor to visit the Finnish embassy amongst the forests that they have. We also had some time to still do some sightseeing in Washington DC which I've always wanted to do. We are in the worst possible place you can be when you travel, in the middle of tourists. And lucky for us, the sauna wasn't heated up at the embassy because, you know, Thanksgiving and so most people were on vacation. However, we did get a 30 minute time slot with the ambassador, which then extended to over an hour. And we're super grateful for this experience. Ambassador Mikko Hautala has worked as an ambassador for the US since 2020 and prior to that he served as ambassador of Finland to Russia for four years. Originally from St. Aoki in Finland, he holds two master's degrees, is ranked as a captain in the military, a reserved and punctual man who loves to read and also speaks five languages. Oh, before we get on with the show, it would mean the world to me and it would help me creating content like this in the future if you could subscribe, smash the like button and maybe share this with a friend. See you next time. For someone who's never heard of you, how would you introduce yourself? I'm a Finnish diplomat uh, serving my country, doing it with uh, great passion. Uh, could you tell people how you came to America? Of course, you were chosen for the mission or you applied and, and so forth. But for people who don't know, what, what does that process look like? The process in, in our system is that uh, you apply for a position, which I did. I was posted to Moscow. I was uh, serving there for as the Finnish ambassador for four years. Then during the final year, I knew that I had to make a choice. Uh, should I continue abroad or should I go back to Finland? Then we basically concluded with my wife that since we have small kids, it, they are still easily sort of uh, movable. So let's continue abroad. And this was open, so I applied and I was uh, chosen. So that's the story. In a way, I find it funny that you came from Russia to America. Have you heard heard that before or, or what are your thoughts on? Yes, I'm the first ambassador who's ever done both places. I think it's been really useful uh, background for me because uh, first of all it makes me interesting because Russia is uh, basically such a big issue uh, for this country as well. So a person who has been there uh, recently who knows the country, who knows the people who are running the country. So it makes me more in interesting than I would have been uh, without that experience. On the other hand, um, I think it's for us because uh, both countries, uh, although they are really different, they are both great powers. So you have certain similarities because they look at the world with this kind of a global view. They, they think in terms of great power politics which is quite different from a sort of small EU country perspective. So it's useful to have this uh, background on because it sort of uh, enables me to quite fast understand uh, the thinking also in the US because there are some, some similarities. Did you have any hardships or prejudice when you came to America? Uh, frankly, no. I have to say that living in Moscow was also relatively easy. I mean, it's, it's really close to Finland. Today it's a well-functioning place. Basically, we knew that uh, DC would be really great for the family. We felt that it, this, if, if there's something easy, this should be easy. Uh, do you miss anything from Russia? I miss the sort of proximity, proximity with Finland because it was only one hour and 20 minutes by plane you could go to see your relatives and so on. That was an easy part. I'm not a person who looks too much sort of behind, sort of, uh, I'm not missing things. I'm, I'm looking basically forward. I think that missing part perhaps comes uh, when I'm, I'm in pension. I always tell people who are like, oh, do you miss me? And do you miss, I'm like, I don't really miss things or people in a way because my mind's always occupied about something yes, else and yes, really yes. wanting to move forward. But you've been in America a little bit. So do you have any pet peeves in America? Not really, I mean. I. I recognize the fact that I live in a bubble. I live in a diplomatic bubble. I live in the best area of the DC. My, uh, I don't have to sort of really wait in the traffic because uh, my, I commute from less than a mile away. My life is in that sense really easy, so I don't have uh, too many annoying things. Also the school, it's a really great school, so our kids are happy, so unfortunately nothing, nothing really to complain about. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the favorite examples that came out in the show was um, when you go to a grocery store, it's not, you don't get the actual price of what you're buying, it's yeah. that plus taxes and it just... Yes, I mean this is, um, but well I, I knew that, so uh, 
I'm, I'm not the kind of person who looks into the sort of receipt and, and calculates and, and, and take the, gets, gets nervous because of that. How often do you go to Finland? A couple of times a year. Uh, I, this is definitely one of the sort of difficult sides of being here because I'd like to go a bit more often, uh, not only because of the family reasons, but also being in this job, it's, it's quite crucial that you stay in, in, in full contact with your own sort of leaders, people uh, back in Finland. It means that uh, there's, a, there's more distance. Of course, you can call and, and, and write and so on and so on, but uh, it's never quite the same. For example, from Moscow, I went to Finland basically once a month, and that was easier. There's more distance. That's, that's clear. What's your first thing you have to do when you get back home? The first thing I have to do, check if my car is still running, if the, <laughs> bat, if, if the battery is still alive. It wasn't in, in June, but we have our home in, in Finland always ready for us. So it's a, and our friends go and take care of that. So it's basically, uh, we could leave tomorrow without anything and we could continue normal living back in Finland the next morning. Well, what do you do on your free time? Because you must be busy pretty much all the time. My usual working day is, is like from 10 to 12 hours. If I'm lucky, I, I'll get home by the time when I, I have to read or I like to read a bedtime story for my two small boys, which are seven and four. If I don't have anything official on dinner or so, uh, I always try to do that so that I will be there and I'll be reading. Because you know, the Finnish studies tell you that, especially for the boys, if your father reads to you, that's important. So if they get the reading habit, especially from the father. Of course, it's useful if mother reads as well, but, uh, but especially father is important. So I, I try to stick to that. I have to say that one of the luxuries of being an ambassador is that you don't have the problem of what to do in your free time. Basically, during the weekends, I try to get, get some rest. Uh, I spend time with my family. I guess it's the same for most of my staff, though, so that uh, weeks are pretty busy. Then we try to keep a weekend sort of uh, free of, of any, anything formal. I like that. And I mean, you're from Finland, so you really do value work-life balance, but you do still do the 10, 12 hours. But yes. it's great that you have this balance. And I admire it as a young man that that's what you, that you read to your kids. And I will definitely take that into consideration when uh, when I get kids. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's great to read them. And I like to read a lot myself. So uh, I have a system. Uh, I read systematically, so every in the beginning of every year, I sort of uh, compose a reading list. Books that I need to read the next year. I actually wrote them down, so then I try to follow that. I order them, them from Amazon and so on. So uh, I try to sort of systematically do the reading. So I guess reading is my, 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 my only sort of uh, real hobby. I, I, I think I've been doing that for 20 years systematically, so it's, it's, been, it's been good. Mikko, how do you define success? I think success is something that you feel it when you have it, even without any, any specific words. If I, if I would describe it uh, or define it, it's, it's the feeling that you've, you get that you do something which is meaningful for you, and then you feel that you can somehow control the outcomes. The thing I'm, I'm dealing with is, is something I, I want to deal with, and then I, I, can, I, can, do, I, I can get some, some, some results. Which, uh, which are useful not only for myself, but, for, but in my case, for my country. So this is success, but it's a kind of a constant feeling that it feels good. I mean, if you don't have it, then you, then you know that something is missing. So I think success, I don't define it by, by monetary terms that I, I have to get rich or something. Obviously, anybody who wants to become a diplomat in the Finnish system, I mean, you basically decide that I won't become rich. I won't become successful by, by some, some kind of conventional meaning. But I truly feel and I'm happy with what I'm doing. And I, I feel that I can learn all the time. Uh, so I'm almost 50 years old and I still feel that I'm a rookie. I, I'm learning new things. And like I came here, I hadn't been posted to US. So it's a lot of challenge actually. Uh, you, you have to get to know new people, the new systems and so on. So this is the beauty of being a diplomat. So you, you always get a new start and you have to have it and you have to face new challenges and you have to overcome them. Do you consider yourself lucky? Definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky. I, I have to say that I don't feel anything but really blessed uh, in, in life, both in personal life and also in, in work life. I'm playing with stereotypics here. Yes. In Finland, we have this weird national jealousy thing and you know, if someone's very successful, we're always talking shit about them in a way. In a way. Not me and you, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. but every, some yeah, yeah. people. I, I, know the, I know the So what are your thoughts on how people see success in Finland compared to America, for example? I think it, it depends on, a bit on the generation. I, I think my sense from the 
younger people who are now entering the labor market is that they define it more in terms of value meaning. They want to do something which has some, some deeper meaning. They want to combat against poverty or climate change or, or they want to do something good. They are not so interested in, 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 in sort of what is my pay or will I get a good pension or things like that. I think a generation before me that was more security oriented payment was important and what, what are the benefits and things like that. I think for my generation, I'm a kind of a mix of these bo both worlds. When I sort of finished my high school, uh, that was the really tough economic situation in Finland. I started my studies at the university. It was still, you could basically, I, I was really worried that will I ever be employed in, in a normal way. So that was really something to worry about. So there's an element of, of, of kind of a predictability and stability in your life, plus uh, then, of course, the, the value side. I like what you said about the next generation. I, I do feel like it, it's more like that. And I, I, even when I was coming to America, that's 10 years ago, I had two friends, three friends who were like, of course you're going. Of course, leave your job, leave everything, go. Yeah. But there were people who said, are you, are you sure you're going to make it? Is it a good idea? And that's where I kind of always had this desire to just show people, oh, it is doable. It is. Uh, what are some things that the Finnish embassy or, or the Finnish government is, is doing to help young young people of that generation actually take the leap and, and change the world? I think we are changing the world. It's, it's part of the DNA of the system because, just to give an example, uh, in this country what we do is that, of course, we benefit from it ourselves. So, But what we try to do is to speed up the, the sort of methods of fighting the climate change because we do have certain technologies and know-how. So I think people who are working in our embassy, they can easily sort of see their own work role sort of being consistent with these overall values or goals. So I think it helps people to get motivated. So and I think in case of Finland, I mean, we are not playing a kind of a... It's hard to see Finland playing a negative role globally. I mean, we basically try to do good. And I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we do so because we are so good ourselves, but I, I simply say that we have been blessed by at, the, at least the recent history. So we have been a successful uh, country, we have certain capabilities for doing good, and we are using that. So, uh, so I think it's not too hard for young people to, to get that. At the same time, I have to say that embassy and, 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 and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as diplomat, you always defend your own country. This is different job from, uh, let's say, being in UNICEF or uh, NGO or things like that. So you are kind of, uh, it's my country right or wrong. It, that's the mentality which is there. But of course we try to do that in a modern way. You don't get successful in defending your own interests if you, if you only say that I want what I want, I, I don't care about you. Of course you have to care about these uh, bigger trends and, and you try to sort of uh, adjust your own doing so that they are consistent with these bigger issues. How do you see failure? I think failure is something when you feel that you don't control your own life at all. That things are only happening to you. You don't know what, ha what happens. Uh, you basically are unhappy with what you get. You don't have direction. I think this lack of direction, kind of a feeling that I'm, I'm sort of drifting in my life, I think that's failure. I mean, you, you, you could actually be rich or, or be successful by conventional means. But I think failure is kind of, you're just there and, and you, you can't. You are not sort of, uh, you don't have the steering wheel if somebody else has it. Do you have any tips on, I'm sure you've had your dark moments as well in your career and in life. So do, is there any tips you've kind of honed into that really help you through the hard moments? For me, usually in those situations, I, I, I stop for a moment. I try to reflect and, and go back to a couple of decades. I, I try to sort of put these things into perspective. Usually quite soon in those situations, I find a kind of, a, how to put it, a fountain of inner energy. There's a kind of a flame uh, in me, which starts to sort of, it grows bigger and I get the energy back. If you have a bad day at work, do you bring that home or are you able to separate those? I would be happy to say that I can separate, but no. I think my wife gets a portion of that. <laughs> uh, she's a diplomat too, so I think I'm, I've also been blessed in the sense that uh, she knows uh, what I'm talking about. And I assume there are things, there are government secrets and there are things you are aware of, but you probably, who do you have these conversations with? Is it just you and, 
I'm possibly having secret conversations to deal with things or unpack things that bother you because you probably can't even tell your wife those, or how does that work? Classified information is something that we handle every day. There are specific rules for that. Uh, so obviously that's not something to uh, bring home. How to put it, uh, we have certain rules, how, how to deal with that, and then we of course have those discussions among ourselves. Living with secrets is part of this life. But I would also say that it's um, a diplomacy basis on is based on confidentiality. Many of the things you know and you hear, you not you do not uh, repeat. Sometimes collecting more information than than we are sort of uh, broadcasting. What makes Finnish people unique, if anything? As I see Finns, I used to tell or say that uh, Finns are silently strong. The strength and and, and certain self confidence, uh, especially among the young people, are is, is something that we don't show off too much. There's a kind of a solid performance beneath, uh, kind of a pretty basic and, and uh, a bit quiet sort of surface. And I like this sort of quiet strength um, that is there. The, the word uh, trust, usually people, and I've, I've lived in many countries, uh, usually people feel that Finns are uh, perhaps not the best at, at marketing or sort of telling how good you are, but uh, these guys are really trustworthy. They, 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 they do what they, they promise. And this is a really valuable asset, actually. It really means something. And in, in many cases, like, for example, about Russia, which used to be my previous posting, many uh, Europeans tell me that, that they basically listen to Finns, especially, and, and try to follow the mood of the, fi of, the, of the Finns, because they feel that there's a balance. These guys are balanced. They see the world in realistic ways. But they don't. Uh, they don't panic, uh, and, and, and they, they are balanced in their thinking. So I think this this kind of a, which which may even look a, a being a bit passive, but it's not passivity. It's it's, it's kind of a, trying to keep things in proportion, and, and, and th this is something I, I feel which is very Finnish. What does being Finnish mean to you personally? It means basically everything. I mean, I'm, I'm a Finn. I will always be a Finn. Uh, I'm proud of being a Finn. I'm totally happy being able to represent uh, the happiest nation on earth for four times in a row. I read a Finnish uh, classical literature. I only speak Finnish with my family, so it's, it's, it's part of everything I do. Finland is definitely my country, and it's always going to be. You mentioned sp speaking Finnish with your kids, so your f kids are now growing up in America, not avoiding them being becoming more American, but how do you keep Finnish traditions going on, and, and why is it important to make sure those go on? And as an ambassador, you, you probably keep very Finnish. Why is it anything important? I mean, it's, it's, it's not that uh, we rationally decide that we want to uphold this tradition or this not. I mean, it's part of the, it's part of life, it's part of what you are. For me, it's, there's no specific seeking to, it's, it comes naturally, organically, uh, in, in a way. We, of course, go to Finland uh, as a family and then we live the Finnish life. I'm not an ambassador in Finland, I'm just a ordinary civil servant. Here we uphold the traditions as much as we can. I don't specifically fight against my boys to become more American. They are becoming more American. They speak better English than I do. They sort of adopt many habits here. At the same time, they are of course Finnish boys. They, they stay Finns. And I think the mix, what is coming out of this experience, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. How would you describe Finns being different than other Nordics? Because we, we are the oddballs of that region. <laughs> and I like saying Nordics now because in the past they used to always say Scandinavians and yeah, someone yeah, corrected yeah. me that we're not actually Scandies, we're yeah. Nordics. Yes, yes, and it yes. does help us when we do business to group us with Spotify and all these other Nordic startups. Mm -hmm. So, but how would you differentiate Finns from the other Nordics? I don't see such a great difference these days. I, I think linguistically, yes, but we also have Swedish language as the second language, so, so we could basically claim that we are also part of the Nordic uh, language family in that sense. Basically, it's also so that those other Nordics, they also differentiate quite a lot. So if you ask a Swede, they see a big difference between them and, and, and the Dane or, or Norwegian. So I think we are all different actually in, in quite many ways. So it's not only that Finland is different and all the others are the same. Uh, I think we are different, all of us. But at the same time, I think uh, for the foreigners, I mean, people from the outside of, of the Nordics, I think for them, we are pretty much the same. We occupy those best places in basically all the rankings globally. Usually Finland wins or is second or, or third, or it's the Norwegians or Swedes. So, uh, 
So I, I, I think we don't differentiate so much. I, I think as a group we are, we belong to that group. It's also beneficial for Finland to be part of that group. We don't want to be outside or seen as a kind of an outsider, which we are not. And also here in the U.S., uh, we, we do a lot with the, with the Nordic. Like, for example, I meet a lot of people together as the Nordic Five Ambassadors. So we do that, if not every week, almost every week. What are some core cultural values that are different here in America compared to Finland? And what are your thoughts on this? I think the basic values we have at least if you speak about values, I think they are pretty much the same. I would say they are perhaps not totally alike, but they are aligned. Like uh, we respect democracy, freedom. We respect rule of law. Uh, there has to be a law, there has to be an order. We also think that in terms of ideals, I think we feel also that you have to show compassion to people who are perhaps less fortunate. We have different ways of doing that. Uh, in the Finnish case, it's, it's basically via the taxes. Uh, you have to pay a lot of taxes in order to, to do that. In the US, it's a bit different, but basically it starts from the same feeling or assessment of the people that you have to not only be responsible of yourself, you also have to try to help the others. I think uh, speaking of all the Nordics, that actually binds us together because you always have different interests. I mean, uh, whose money, it's my money or your money. Or you, you, you can discuss about that. But basically, if you share this, some basic core uh, beliefs, I, I think it's always easier to recognize the other that, hey, we are, despite all the differences, we are same group of people, same group of countries that try to, try to do good, not always succeed, but at least try to do it. Do you have an American dream or have you made your own version of, of what that means? No, I, I don't have an American dream. I, I have a Finnish dream, which is uh, basically extremely boring. Basically doing what I'm doing uh, and, and continue doing that. As a Finn, I, I do have a lot of trust in the future. So um, my dream is, is, is uh, doing better, uh, even better what I do and, and, and uh, see what happens. So we talked a little bit about how Finns are maybe not the best at marketing themselves. What, what, what are some thoughts on that that could maybe help the next generation that are listening to this or watching this on how should we market? Because a lot of times in conversation I'll go, yes, I'm from Finland. They go, oh, well, what's what's from Finland? I'm like, Santa Claus, Nokia, Angry Birds, chocolate, and, and, and the list can go on forever. So what are your thoughts on how we could market ourselves better? I think we are... Uh, I think you are correct in the sense that uh, uh, quite often we are not the best ones at that. It's a stereotype, of course, and you have different Finns, and I've seen uh, all kinds of Finns. We are an engineering nation. Uh, there's a lot of belief, for example, in the Finnish business that uh, if you plan or design a good product, it sort of sells itself. So you don't have to mind about that. If it's good, then everybody will hear about that. Everyone but they want to buy it. That's not how things work, uh, we know that. Sometimes it's a bit painful to try to explain to people that you have to, you have to really have a message. And somehow uh, you have to define what's your, as they call it, value proposition. What's the difference? What, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the reason? How to be more sort of uh, open and how, how to be more concise, how to be crisp in, in this messaging. I think this is something we, we have to do. I just give you a so small example. It was in Russia. A final Finnish company was trying to sell a, a, a technology. I heard the speech. It was basically that, hey, it's a good machine. It, it works like this and, and, and please buy this. Those who were buying, uh, they said, well, that sounds interesting. Thanks. It, it's a machine. Yes. <laughs> then uh, in the evening, nothing much happened. I, I asked the Finnish guys, that, what's so special about your machine? Then they said, well, it's, it's totally unique because it's the only technology in the world that basically takes the raw material and, and, and uh, x-rays it, and then it sort of uh, utilizes it individually on the basis of this uh, artificial intelligence sort of uh, nanosecond decision making. I mean, you basically, the difference is that the raw material gets to be used in an optimal way, and you don't have much waste. I said, well, you should have told them. You, you never said anything about the artificial intelligence or that you x-ray everything that comes in, that, uh, that, this is, that there's a reason why this is pro probably a bit more expensive than, than the others. So, so we are not really good at the communications, or, or many of us are not. So I think we should be a bit more brave about that, a bit, bit, bit more outgoing. 
But I think with the younger generation, that's, that's improving. It doesn't totally fix it uh, because it, it requires, because even the young people, they are the products of our schooling system, a certain culture. I think it has to be specially trained so that we can at least improve, fix things in those places where it has to be fixed. As an ambassador, I have to ask you this, because as a kid, I thought I, w I wanted to be a diplomat, an architect, or an astronaut. Okay. So how does one become a diplomat? Is, is there steps that you need to think of if I'm raising a kid, are there steps I need to think of to have that opportunity available for my offspring? Or if you're a 15-year-old, what are some things you could do to possibly have this avenue of becoming a diplomat? The answer is yes. Uh, you have to take certain steps which increase the likelihood of your getting in. Basically, the, the system is a, it's a closed system. It's like the military. So you have only basically one way of becoming a diplomat. You have to apply for service and you have to undergo tests and, and, and selection process which have many phases. Uh, basically in order to qualify you need to have the master's degree, you have to have certain language qualifications there and then it depends on your sort of personal qualities and also what the ministry is uh, uh, willing to have. Like in certain years uh, the, the selection process may emphasize certain languages for example or certain other qualities that uh, hey, need, we need more economists. And, uh, so, so, so there might be some situational facts or, or sort of dimensions, but, but basically you have to get masters. I mean, we, we take in uh, all kinds of people, I mean, with all kinds of profiles. It can be history, political science, economics, it can be the law. I mean, so, so, so we take in different, because we, we, we need uh, people with different backgrounds. But basically, then you, in order to really get in, you need to have some foreign experience, be it uh, sort of uh, a traineeship abroad. You, you, it's also good to, to have studied abroad. So you have to basically build your CV with this, this in mind pretty early on uh, in order to sort of uh, pass the first first sort of uh, selection because otherwise you simply the competition is so 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 tough i decided my career basically when i was 13 i was i was silent i told my parents about this when i was 24 so i i i, I was silent on this for uh, you know, like 11 years uh, it was a secret but i, I chose pretty early on and then I, I i basically took all the steps with this in mind. What is really important, and I always say this to all the young people who are thinking of this, is that you really have to be interested in foreign policy and security policy. Never become a diplomat just because you want to be an ambassador, or you want to have kind of a social status, or you want to work abroad. These days, uh, people can work abroad without being a diplomat. So that was different like 50 years ago. Would you talk about the cultural aspects of this building and, and why it's important? And, and this is a beautiful, beautiful building. And I've heard about this in the media before that it's in the, there's a forest here and it's one of the most unique diplomatic buildings in Washington. Could you talk a little bit about the, the Finnish construct here? Yeah, well, basically, we are extremely proud of this building, not only because it's the, it was the first building in DC that got the, the lead platinum standard for the environment. I think it's a unique place, not only because of sauna, because of the view, the architecture. Many American friends who have visited this place, also those who are, and especially those who are here for the first time, they sort of feel that, hey, this is really a nice place. And I have to say that working here every day, it feels like home here. So this is really Finnish building, our Nordic building in the middle of uh, America. A couple of weeks ago, I, I visited the headquarters of Amazon in Seattle, and uh, they have this building called Spheres. It's a kind of a meeting space with uh, a lot of trees inside. It's a kind of rainforest inside. They explained to us what's the, what was the idea of, of having this kind of a meeting space. That, uh, that in the forest, you think differently. So, so they feel that this, this environment and trees will give these people a, a boost to think differently and think better. Then I said to myself, hey, uh, we live in a forest, somewhere, so we think differently sort of uh, all the time. So I'm gonna ask you 10 words and uh, just tell me what you think and uh, we're gonna be good. Are you ready? Yes. First word, blue. Lake. White. Snow. Sauna. Good to have. Sisu. Really important. Black. Car. Green. Tree. Coca-Cola. Tastes good. The Matrix. Don't know what it is. Finland. Perfect. Love. Must have. And what do you have to say to the next generation of uh, leaders? Be honest, even if it hurts.